Um, look, I hardly get to spend any time playing games anymore. I don't even own a, an Xbox um, because I spend all my time creating games and kind of asking questions like, well, what if games could do good? Uh, you know, who said computer games have to be some violent battle between fantasy characters? Um, but if they do have to be that, well, who would win in a fight between Michael Laws and Mary Poppins? <laughs> well, okay, maybe not a fight, maybe a uh, contest of ideas. You see, Mary Poppins famously said that in every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. You find the fun and snap the jobs again. And that was her advice when she was telling us to take our medicine with a spoonful of sugar. Michael Laws, on the other hand, on his radio live show last year said that if mass murder was ever to be committed in this country, it would be committed by a gamer. <laughs> now when he says that, no doubt he's thinking about games like Grand Theft Auto 4, where you, know, you uh, play the role of a Russian immigrant who gets involved in the criminal underworld. So this game sold $500 million US in its opening month. That's half a billion dollars revenue. Um, by way of comparison, Batman The Dark Knight had an opening month of about a bit over 200 million. Um, so already the, the games industry is already bigger than Hollywood in terms of revenues. So this is what Michael Laws is thinking about, but let me put this in context. These type of games, at most, make up 17% of uh, revenues from games that are out there. So there's a whole nother world out there of what, is it, uh, what constitute games. So if Mary Poppins was with us today, this is probably the game she would be playing. It's called Chore Wars, and uh, on surface level, it looks like a Dungeons and Dragons style fantasy game. And you go in, you create your character, choose, you know, you're gonna be a warrior or a magician or whatever, and take on such epic quests as the quest to take out the trash, <laughs> the quest to tidy one's bedroom. Um, and you can all log in as a family and do it together. Um, and, and, you know, and effectively, it's a giant um, star chart sticker board. Um, it's actually an example of a trend to apply gaming principles to effectively business applications. And so, look, everyone who logged in, checked in here today um, on Foursquare on their iPhone will probably have a sense of, of that trend and how people are applying the things that make games so fun or addictive or compelling and applying it to getting things done. This is uh, Len, uh, Les Driver. He is 98 on Monday and lives in Dargaville. And his granddaughter introduced him to uh, Nintendo Wii and he said, okay, th this is great fun, go and buy me one. So he now plays um, Wii Sports, um, 10 pin bowling, which is something that he can do in his retirement uh, village by himself. And also when the grandkids come, it's something he can interact with them um, and do. And he's really just one example of one of the, I suppose one of the success stories in gaming in recent years has been the sheer diversity, diversity of people who now play games and the sheer diversity of the kinds of games that are out there. So the Nintendo Wii is probably a, a popular example. You, you no longer need a joystick to play a game. For some people, that was actually a barrier to engaging with games. You know, we're playing games on our mobile phones while we're commuting. Um, we're playing games on Facebook. You know, once upon a time when you played an online game, it was with a complete stranger on the other side of the world. Now you can play it with complete strangers that you're associated with on Facebook, or maybe your real life friends. Um, so I mean, that, there was a recent survey came out. The average age of a game player in New Zealand is 33 years old. Now, they're, they're people like me with disposable incomes, with families, with careers, with, with things to do. It, we spend more time online playing games than we do checking our email, watching videos, or doing online act, uh, auctions. So people often say to me, OK, I get that games are a significant cultural force these days, and people are spending a lot of time playing games. So, but really, you know, what if all that time they spent playing games, they could actually be learning something, doing something constructive? Well, they already are. When you're playing a game, you're learning where all those gold coins are. 
you're learning how to jump and defend yourself at the same time. You're learning how to defend yourself from a Zerg um, rush. You're learning whatever it is you need to learn to complete that level to win that game. And this is very much um, one of the philosophies of a volunteer not-for-profit group that I'm involved with called the Life Game Project. And one of the things that they do is refurbish um, computers and provide them to people who otherwise wouldn't have the ability or the access to play games. So this is some um, young people from the Rawiri Residents Association in South Auckland. And they can come in and play games um, in a supervised and supportive environment. And I'm not talking about educational games. I'm not talking about horribly worthy e-learning software. I'm just talking about games, regular games that they can um, access on, online on the internet and things like that. And because in just playing those existing entertainment-based games, they're learning all of these kind of skills. There's an incredible amount of numeracy in computer games. It's one of the things they do very well. There's an incredible amount of problem solving. Um, I would say resource allocation is really one of the fundamental things that games are all about. Is it like, right, will I spend this money now or am I going to, uh, on say a power up or a different weapon, or should I just hold off and save up for something bigger? That's a common challenge that a game puts in front of people. Now aren't these also all of the skills and learning outcomes that we're asking our educational institutes to um, imbue into our students these days? So this is just talking about the realm of entertainment games. You'll find these values in Grand Theft Auto 4. But what I actually want to talk to you about more today is a whole other genre of games uh, called serious games. So they're a game first. They're fun first. But their purpose is something more serious. Um, so President Barack Obama has um, sponsored an initiative called uh, Innovate to Educate, which is all about creating games that help um, America's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics curriculum. Um, there are games out there that help you take your drugs. Um, I'm working on a, starting a project to teach fish biology on an Xbox. Um, and the University of Auckland Medical School and the Ministry of Health are currently clinically trialing a game that teaches teenagers how to manage depression and moods. This is a game um, developed by Runaway Play, um, who are a division of Natural History New Zealand down in Dunedin. Um, and in it, you play a butterfly floating around the Amazonian rainforest. And um, it's an example of what we call a factual game. All of the animals, the flora and fauna in this game are accurate representations of what you would find in the incredibly biodiverse Amazon rainforest. So the things you need to learn to succeed in this game are the things you'd need to learn, say, in your unit standard about Amazonian rainforest. The learning content and the game content are one. Um, and you play it on Facebook with your friends and um, share things as you go. This is a game called Fold It, where you fold um, protein chains in 3D, um, designed by the University of Washington. And so the thing about protein chains is it's, even with supercomputers, it's very difficult to figure out all of the billions of possible combinations of how these chains could fold themselves up into the optimum, most compact um, way. So what they've done is they've farmed this workout to game players around the world and, um, and really rely on our natural human ability um, for either spatial 3D recognition um, and pattern matching. So we go in, we play the game, we fold it up nice and compactly, and then send it back to the University of Washington's um, servers, which they then take the results that the gamers have created as the shortlist for further scientific investigation. It's also a fun game. At which point, people go, hang on, this looks like postgraduate chemistry or biology or something, and you're telling me this is fun? And it is. And the reason why this heavy-duty challenge is fun is because games, what makes games fun is the fact that they're challenging you to learn all the time. It's actually the learning that makes something fun. You know, think about it. If you, as soon as you master a game, as soon as you know everything about the game, it actually ceases to be fun. 
Um, when, you, when you reach the age when you realised you could always get a draw playing noughts and crosses, you, know, you kind of stopped playing noughts and crosses, <laughs> uh, unless you had a younger sibling to, to beat. <laughs> so what games have done as an industry is optimise this cycle. They give you a clear goal, defeat this baddie. They give you the right tools and weapons and power-ups. They set you a challenge, which is a, which is a legitimate challenge, but it is also achievable. And then they give you feedback, rewards, scores, points, and they do it fast. And then they do it all over again, but harder. Now you may also recognize that as a pretty classic model for human motivation. So what games are creating are motivated, self-directed learners. You know, people want to play games. You know, they may or may not want to pick up their textbook. Games also let you win and lose. Um, and what that means is you get to make mistakes. You get to have consequences in your actions. But at the same time, it's only a game, so you get to do it safely. And that's pretty much a foundation for experiential learning. So this is a game called My Friend Quest, developed by Bright Mind Labs in Whangarei. And uh, it was a game that teaches children on the autistic spectrum to recognize and respond to emotions. And um, if you're an autistic child, you know, that can be a pretty scary thing. You don't really get the chance to go and practice on other kids. Um, so this game gives you the environment to safely look at and recognize um, uh, emotions. The other cool thing about this game was put together by a child psychologist, um, Dr. Ahmed, uh, Yvette Ahmad, and a lot of the design choices in this game are based on clinical research. Things, for instance, like there's research that suggests that autistic children don't like direct eye contact. So all the characters in this game look a little bit off to the side. Um, there's research that suggests they're attracted to spinning mechanical um, objects. So there are stars over top of the heads of the characters that you do interact with. So effectively, they've applied clinical behavioral uh, th therapy and theory to a computer game. Um, and on pilot clinical trials, um, have had initially positive results. This is uh, Cash Dash, is a project to develop a virtual world that educates ch children about financial literacy. And one of the design choices we're just kind of we're grappling with, trying to decide if we'll go with or not at the moment, is to have a virtual shady money lender character, or someone who jacks up interest rates, or, so, or even to allow children to rack up virtual debt. Yeah. And this is what, it'd be quite interesting, because this is with virtual currency, and by golly, the kids playing this game will be just as upset about being ripped off with virtual currency that we give them <laughs> as they would if, if it happened with their real money in real life. But maybe this could provide a safe environment for them to learn a hard lesson about money management. Games are abstract formal systems, which is a mathematical way of saying they're made up of lots of rules, but rules about how a system, how a world works. And that's what games have always done. They've helped us make sense of the world. Um, and what that means is they're kind of intended to have an application in the real world, which is situated learning. And this is nothing new. We've used games this way for, for 2,000 years, more, longer. Um, back when we, our view of the world was that, oh, it's the will of the gods, we invented games that were about divination. Uh, we invented games of chance. We invented the dice. Um, as society evolved, reached the Middle Ages, we got far more strategic, we invented chess. Um, these days, with modern technology, we could simulate a whole world. And look, that's why Grand Theft Auto is such a great game. It's nothing to do with the surface storyline of violence. It's the fact that it's probably one of the most um, compelling, in-depth, and sophisticated simulations of what modern life would look like. So if games are world simulators, it follows that therefore they must contain world views and value judgments. And if you peel those back and start to look at those, well, you'll actually end up encouraging critical thinking through playing games. This is a classic game, SimCity. 
um, lauded for being you know, an educational, constructive game where you play a mayor of a city and you build it up over time and do all sorts of good things. It is a Marxist simulator. <laughs> you can bulldoze anyone's house for the sake of just driving a road through and for the sake of central planning, and ultimately the optimum way to get more money is to raise taxes. A similar game is Civilization, where you grow an empire from 2000 BC all the way through to the Space Age. This game is the American 20th century, where technological progress is valued above all else. So another game um, that makes a statement about, well, the American politics, I suppose, is this one called September the 12th. And this is a Middle Eastern marketplace. Now, there was just one terrorist down the bottom of the screen there who's now been attacked with a rocket launcher. However, there was a little bit of collateral damage. And some other people, just ordinary citizens, have seen it. And they have now turned into terrorists. The second missile, it got the terrorists. But there's a little bit of collateral damage. And now more terrorists are being created. This game has the worldview that violence begets violence. It did not tell you that with any text on screen. It did not tell you that with a movie or an AV presentation. In fact, there's not even a story in the traditional sense. There is, there's hardly even a beginning, middle, and end. The thing that has told you that violence begets violence is the rules of this game. And that's the only thing that communicates that message, is the rules, the structure of the system. And it teaches that in a far more compelling um, an experiential way, a far more um, deeply engaging way than if I had just flashed up on the screen and told you um, that this thing was good or bad. So what if we could, I don't know, create some really quite high-minded concepts um, and teach them through games? Uh, is it possible to make a game that um, would encourage us all to be nice to each other? Um, a game that would encourage generosity? Well, there already is a prototype, um, and about 60 million people play it every month. <laughs> and it's called Farmville, and if you have a Facebook account, you're no doubt aware of it. One of the key gameplay mechanics of Farmville is gift giving. Um, when you log in, it you presents you with some gifts and it asks you to offer them to various friends. Um, and very quickly, the community of Farmville aren't stupid people. Everyone realized it's in everyone's best interests to start giving gifts to each other. There's also evidence that this behavior has trickled, uh, uh, trickled on and followed on in real life um, at an individual level. But also, um, for the Haiti earthquake relief, uh, relief fund, um, Farmville created not trade aid products, but virtual trade aid goods. And Farmville players donated or bought $1 million US worth of virtual trade aid goods, goods that did not exist, um, as a way of donation towards that earthquake relief fund. So that gift giving um, behavior that was encouraged by the game found, it way, found its way through into real life. So this is all intended, I suppose, just as a, as a teaser of what could be possible um, with computer games. You know, what would be possible if we took games seriously? Would parents pay more attention to the video games their children are playing and look for ways to integrate those lessons into real life? Um, would parents may pay more attention to the play of their children, no matter what form it is? Full stop. Um, if we took games seriously, what other games could we create that solve issues in our own local communities? Um, and what value could we find in the games that we're already playing today? Thank you. Thank you.